Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Idol Podcast, the podcast where I do weekly book reviews. This week, I read Black and Blue by Carmen Best, who is formerly the chief of police for the Seattle Police Department. Now, she describes herself as a proud Black voice who speaks of the thin blue line, so you know what to expect with this book. It was released in 2021 under HarperCollins leadership, and it is a nonfiction piece that details her experience as the first Black woman chief of Seattle PD. Now, this book is pretty short. It's 175 pages. It starts out with the acknowledgments, which typically is at like the end of the book. And uniquely enough, this does have an introduction and a prologue, which I thought was odd for a nonfiction piece especially. But the introduction opens up with acknowledging the current state of America. And when I say the current state, we're probably thinking more like 2020, 2021-ish. So there includes commentary immediately on police brutality, racism, and sexism. So that highlights her, I guess, position, you could say, as a Black woman in America during 2020 who is also leading a police department. And for context, that period of time, not only was it stressful because of the pandemic, there was a heightened awareness of police brutality mainly i think because a lot of people um were you know quarantined at home and so there was more uh, tension on these police brutality cases which we're going to touch on but that posed a very difficult um difficult few months for anyone in law enforcement and particularly those in leadership positions now what this does is it kind of underlines the idea of intersectionality. And I've talked about this in the past and there's a few more books that I'm gonna cover um, in the next coming months that will talk about this as well. But intersectionality is essentially when two groups of um, marginalized people overlap. So for example, being a black woman, you are black and you are also a woman. So you share the experiences of sexism as well as racism. Now her being a black woman within this law enforcement field, that gives us an entirely unique um, perspective when it comes to everything that has happened in 2020, which I think is where a lot of the pull will come for this, for this book. Now the prologue um, opened up framing the events surrounding her kind of surrounding her appointment to be the permanent chief of police. So when the prologue opens, she is the acting uh, chief of police and they release the list of, you know, the top three candidates and she is not on it. So that kind of pulls the readers in because we're trying to understand, okay, how did you jump from this to being, you know, the permanent chief? Um, but it also kind of, you know, sets the tone that this is going to be a serious read. Not necessarily depressing or tough or anything like that, but it starts out with her not meeting this goal, you know. Okay, and with the physical structure, there are seven chapters. Each chapter is followed by a tactical debrief, which is usually one to two pages, and it's essentially just a summary of um, the chapter preceding it. And it, it just wraps up, you know, her thoughts. But there also can be questions. And I think usually it's like three three or four questions that she asks the audience, which is kind of like a call to action um, relating to the discussion that she had in the chapter. And we're going to touch on that towards the end as well. Now this book is unique and it's kind of reflective of both the introduction and the prologue because in my opinion I see prologues as an opening for like a fiction piece or something or like a, a mystery thriller whereas an introduction is something that just kind of gives you an idea of what we're going to be talking about mostly in non-fic books. And what I picked up on is there's kind of two styles of writing here. So the first is her reflection on her childhood. 
which is not uncommon for uh, people of leadership positions or um, celebrity status. When they write these books, they talk about their childhood because it directly relates to the decisions that they make in adulthood. So what we see is that she uses a lot of her memories to relate to her professional and adult challenges, mostly revolving around, you know, racism and, and tough uh, situations. And it goes to show that the racism that she experiences as an adult, they kind of reflect her time as a child. Of course, the situations change, um, which is kind of sad because <laughs> we're talking like, you know, few decades in between that but she also does discuss the function of childhood environments and breeding racism but also in breeding reactions to racism so with her obviously a lot of her reflection is her acknowledging how she dealt with microaggressions and things like that but she also use, says that you know these kids that she was experiencing in high school they didn't wake up one morning and say, we don't like black people. You know, they were just hearing that probably around from their parents and whatnot. So I do like the fact that she included her reflections and her perspective on her childhood experiences, because it does reinforce that the way that you develop um, when you're in those formative years of high school and middle school, it really does build the foundation for how you're going to deal with the rest of your life and all of the challenges that come with that. When it comes to tone, so because we have kind of these two areas of talking about childhood, but also uh, framing the events of her professional career and her professional high, are, we have two different tones here. So of course, I would say overall, the book is informal. And that's because it's very clear um, where she stands on certain things. There's not like a strict adherence to revealing information or anything like that. But you can also pick up on her defensiveness, I will say. And that's in basically her, her explaining her actions and her decisions during the year of 2020. But then on the flip side, you have this formal aspect because she includes different speeches or letters or announcements or decrees, things that, um, you know, she was issuing while she was chief of police. She includes that and then she kind of, you know, the chapter will be explaining, you know, what she was, what her thought process was. So I actually really enjoy that. I like when uh, authors bring in outside information, especially stuff like, you know, her her um her speeches during her occupying the the chief of police position because you kind of get to pull the curtain back and understand what was going on behind the scenes while she was you know issuing these words so we kind of toggle back and forth between her actually talking and it feels like she's having a conversation with you and then she pulls in these formal documents so i think that we have a great balance of each of those um influences and she herself points out, she herself points out the dichotomy of being a black mother, but also being the chief of police, but also, and this is something that she distinctly made in the introduction, being a believer of law and order and Black Lives Matter. So we understand exactly where her, not necessarily alliance or allegiance, but we know how she feels about both of these polarizing topics that sometimes it feels like either side is making you say, okay, one or the other. You can't be both. You can't believe in both. Okay. A couple of themes here. So the first being police brutality. So there's this career parallel where she began her career in law enforcement in 1992 which was when the Rodney King incident happened. And this was before I was born. So, but I still, you know, I know about it, but I, looking back on different, you know, news broadcasts and things like that, it was a big deal. And I think that it was one of the few times that the world took notice, or maybe not the world at that time, the country took notice of such incidents. It's not like that was the only, you know, 
instance of police brutality in history, but that was one that really captured a lot of people's attention. Whereas she retired in 2020, and of course, this is when there's a long list, unfortunately, of victims of police brutality, but the main ones are George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, which honestly, it's kind of sad that like she started and ended her career and the same thing is happening, but it indicates a stagnation when it comes to, I guess, law enforcement or, or public opinion of it because everyone in 1992 was like wow that's sad that's horrible that's terrible and it's like we're dealing with the same thing so I think that you can track her personal stake when it comes to her law enforcement career because she kind of has this thing and anyone I think in public service is thinking that I'm going to be a part of the change for a better world. So it was just interesting that her career happened to align with those um, significant in incidents. Now with 2020, it was different because of the pandemic. Everyone was essentially home and quarantining or whatever and life wasn't normal anymore. And so when these instances happened, it was like, it kind of just blew up. It sparked the, the flame of unrest throughout the entire world. And so there were worldwide protests that were calling for reform. And this directly impacts law enforcement because they have to figure out how to respond to this because they are public servants. Um, but it's, it's an interesting perspective to have a, a police officer during this time period because I've never really sat and talked to a police officer about, you know, how the pressures that this puts on them when it comes to these instances, you know, just going viral and, and pissing people off essentially and, and sparking all different types of debates, but particularly for the leadership, how they're going to handle this because now instances that are happening around the world are being reflected in protests outside of your headquarters, whether you were involved or not, whether this incident happened in your police department or not, now you're going to face the consequences. So that was a perspective I think I needed when it comes to law enforcement and how they deal with, you know, the protest and um, just accountability. But that was certainly a reoccurring theme here is just the response to 2020 as a whole. And then last theme, the fight or flight, flight or fight approach. I don't know which one comes first, but basically the idea of how you approach hardships. So Mrs. Bess is very interesting in that I would say she doesn't really fall into either category because she doesn't flee, but she doesn't antagonize or she's not ever the aggressor when she is approached with tough situations or tough problems, according to this book, at least. Um, she does harp on situational leadership a lot, and that's just understanding how to best use your resources, whether that be your staff, your training, your protocols to receive the best outcome. But specifically in the face of microaggressions. She never really takes it personally, but she doesn't let it hinder, you know, her, her day, her ability, you know, her confidence. And so that was also in itself a unique perspective because being on the receiving end of certain microaggressions, it kind of pisses me off. And personally, my response is just to, um, yeah, just leave that person alone. I don't really need to talk to you anymore. Um, and she kind of has a similar approach, but she's also someone that's not going to be pushed out of a certain space because of who she is. One incident that highlighted her approach was when she, um, in high school, she went to a party and they, she clearly was not welcome, her or her other black friend. And her initial reaction was just to leave. You know, why do we have to disrupt the flow of things? And her friends kind of 
deciding that they were going to take a stand, she reflects on how that was the best decision because she wasn't going to be um, influenced to, what's the word I'm looking for? Make her existence disappear, if that makes any sense. But you also have to keep in mind, things obviously change as we get older, but a lot of professional environments, they don't allow for any type of retaliation. So when you're dealing with these instances of microaggressions and racism, especially if you're in law enforcement, I can only imagine you're not, it's never going to be in your best interest to really kind of, I guess choose the fight option because, and not physically fight, but you know, even if that means like an argument or whatever may have you, you're not really ever going to get anywhere in a professional environment because if the, the leadership, if they don't acknowledge, you know, the provoking, if they don't acknowledge the racism that you're dealing with, then they're going to see your response as something outlandish and extreme. So which is really tough. That's really, that's a really tough position to be in to just have to take that, you know, in order to keep your job. But, and she didn't really, that was one thing I didn't really like about the book because she never really discussed anything like that when it came to her profession. It was always kind of alluded to the fact that she's dealt with racism. She's dealt with microaggressions outside of her workplace and kind of left it at that. So Okay, a couple highlights before I hit the review. So there were a few things that I did not, I wasn't really aware of, including CHOP, C-H-O-P, which was the Capitol Hill occupied protest that were happening in Seattle. There was CHAZ, C-H-A-Z, which, which was the Capitol Hill autonomous zone. The consent decree, which is guidelines to promote police integrity. Of course, there was defund the police. For those of you that don't know, it's just the movement calling for um, reducing police funding in a di direct response to police brutality. The Black Lives Matter movement was mentioned a few times, and it's the movement to increase awareness of the black victims of racism and police brutality. And then lastly, collaborative policing. And that's just working amongst everyone in charge, whether that be the city council, the state government, you know, et cetera, in order to police the citizens and kind of just redistributing that um, um, responsibility. So some of those topics I wasn't very familiar with, um, but those were certainly the highlights here of this book. Now, so for my review, so this was a short book, short, um, short review here. <laughs> so I personally did not enjoy the structure or the style of the book. I would have structured it a little differently. I would have, I really enjoyed when she included her um, documentation, her speeches, whatever may have you, and she kind of further analyzed the thinking behind that. I thought the whole book should have been that. Like every, I don't know, every law, let's just say, that you put into place or whatever may have you. Those formal decisions being looked at informally and broken down for the citizens to understand, I thought that was interesting. And there were only maybe three or four times when she included documentation or letters or emails that she sent out, but that really caught my attention. Um, I think that's what the tactical debrief should have been. In my opinion, it was misused because it really just... It literally was just a, a paragraph, a summary that in a lot of ways was repeating the exact same things that she had said in the chapter beforehand. And the questions that were included afterwards, I thought they were too broad and not necessarily insightful enough. So I didn't even really bother to answer them because it's kind of like, well, when was a time that you faced situational leadership? Like, I, I don't know. I didn't really enjoy it. I think it could have been used as a better analysis tool than as a kind of conclusion summary area. Um, what's my other critique? Oh my gosh. So the first chapter is titled No Successes Without Hard Work. 
the chapter is essentially about her failures. So I just like little stuff like that. I guess because I, I break down these books, I look at it and I'm just kind of like, what was the thought process here? It probably has a lot to do with the fact that this book details events essentially for most of 2020 and it was released in 2021. So that's a really fast turnaround time. So maybe it was just kind of put out quickly. I think that the author intention was really to just back up her decisions in her retirement because she kind of left while they were dealing with a lot of controversy, I guess, when it came to the decision to cut the police funding a lot, a lot. And so when she actually explained her reasoning behind not defunding the police and she gave an entire breakdown and it was a document that was um, maybe like 15 pages long, that was really interesting to me and that was the part of the book I enjoyed. The other fluffy stuff like talking about childhood and, and losing her student body president seat, like I didn't really enjoy it. I don't know. I it was okay. This it's not a bad book. I probably will not no, I won't be rereading this. In my opinion, I feel like we could have gotten more information, more intriguing information out of like an interview. So I don't know. It's not a bad book, though. It's definitely an okay read. I just wish it would have been structured a little differently and maybe be like 50%. Um, 50%. I don't know what to call those formal documents that she had because it was a mix between like letters to the city council, but also like um, press releases and stuff like that. So I felt like it could have been 50% that and then 50% the explanation and the analysis from her perspective behind that. So yeah. Um, the one takeaway I have is that 2020 was probably the most challenging year for law enforcement in particular. And then to take it even a step further, minority officers were put in a very precarious position because you're dealing with these two sides clashing and what we see in the media is that you can either be on this side or that side, but you have these officers, these black officers that they're a part of both. So like, where does that leave them? So I, I did like that this highlighted the stress that law enforcement was under during that year and everything that they had to deal with on top of the pandemic, which was already stretching them thin. And that's one thing also that I didn't really think about along with the um, our medical people, like the doctors, the nurses that were on the front lines during the pandemic, so were the police officers. And if we take it back to 2020, everyone was scared, everyone was anxious, no one knew what to do, and they had to just deal with it. They had to still continue to do their jobs. So I like that aspect of the book as well. It definitely gave me a better perspective on law enforcement. I just wish it would have been written differently. So that's all. But that's it um, for now. I also uh, have just finished Open Water. It's a fiction piece, so I will be releasing that review shortly. And that's all for now. I am still working on The Sword and the Shield. That book is a lot more information heavy than I expected it to be, which is a great thing. But I like to take my time when I'm given a lot of info and statistics and events so that book will probably come in the next few weeks or so but other than that I think there are maybe two more fiction books that I'm gonna finish shortly and then another nonfiction. so yeah you never know I have so many books there'll be a review coming shortly I don't know but thank you all for tuning in to another episode I will see you next week I hope everyone has a great weekend thank you